The feline. Oh, the feline. Yeah. What do you call hair under a cow's nose? A moustache. I got it as soon as you were just saying. All right, I like that. So we are, according to our syllabus, right on schedule. We're in central nervous system, the brain, and the spinal cord. And we're going to be here for about three lectures. Today and all of next week. Not about, exactly, three lectures. Uh, today and all next week. And then uh, the uh, 3rd of November, Tuesday, is our third exam. Okay? So it's about a week and a half away. All right? We're moving out of nerve physiology, but we're not leaving it. We're transitioning from nerve physiology into areas that we're going to learn how the nerves are organized. And I think this is actually one of the most fascinating segments within, or chapters, or um, topic areas within 201. And it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable how the central nervous system works. Uh, but before we move on too quickly, um, I'm going to play a little movie trailer for you. Uh, it's not Star Wars. <laughs> so we all wound up. Oh, man. That's lame. Oh, man, what happened to my music? It's time to let the rain go. But just in case you think nothing ever happened to me. Eddie Mora. Hey. Tell me about this book. Well, how much have you written on it? How about more? Oh, I suppose I can help you with that. You know how they say that we can only access 20% of our brain? This lets you access all of it. They've had clinical trials and it's FDA approved. I just said it's curious. That's all. That guy looked totally honest, huh? I was blind, but now I see. A tablet a day, and I was limitless. I now had cultural appetites. Since when do you speak Italian? I finished my book in four days. I like to renegotiate my bets. Math became useful. From 12,000 to 2.3 million in 10 days. I'm baffled by this guy. So, Eddie Mora, you do know you're a freak. What's your secret? Medication. Okay. We're gonna have to watch the rest. The movie's called what? Limitless. Limitless. Okay, so it just is to tease you a little bit. Did it? Was it successful? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the reason I like to play that is this is a theme that we've been uh, tickling audiences with for a long time. I mean, this curiosity about the human brain and how much of the human brain we use and how much is essentially unused. Right? There's, there's a lot of neurons within the brain that you're not using uh, on a daily basis. And slowly over time, those neurons will actually die off. And <coughs> neurons themselves, we've already covered this, they're amitotic. Right? Meaning what? What does that mean? They don't, they, they don't divide. So once you lose it, it's gone. Um, we're born with more neurons than we're ever going to need. Right? It's actually very similar to... Um, eggs within the female. There's more eggs in the female than will ever be used within the menstrual cycle throughout the lifetime of that individual. Okay? So there is redundancy. So some people say, well, why would you waste eggs or why would you waste neurons? Why would you actually have neuronal tissue that you don't use on a daily basis? Okay? Now the answer, we're not in the reproductive section, but you'll learn about uh, the menstrual cycle, and you'll learn about eggs and the utility there and the value of that redundancy next semester in 202. But right now, what we're talking about is the redundancy within the nervous system. And so there are uh, parallel neuronal circuitry that exists within our brains and our central nervous system in order to make sure that we can complete important tasks throughout our day. And when that pathway is actually compromised, Say, for example, in a stroke patient, many of you are happy to know that there's a lot that can be done for that patient after a stroke. Why? Because maybe it was grandma or grandpa, 
Maybe it will be mom or dad. Or maybe it's going to be your patients and you want to do physical therapy or you want to impact these patients and deal with post-stroke patients. And we can't reattach or heal central nerves. They don't regenerate. We already covered that. But we can actually tap into the plasticity of this nervous system and find an alternative route that maybe wasn't being used before that we can actually use now for the same task. And that's where training comes into play. So how many of you are athletes? Even if it's recreational, you played something in um, high school, like you were on the chess team, <laughs> okay? Anything. Seriously, chess I would consider it as a sport in this context, okay? So when you practiced, after you practiced that sport, let's hear some of the examples. Shout them out. Volleyball. Volleyball. Tennis. Baseball. Tennis. Wrestling. Tennis. Tennis. Fencing, boxing, golf, cheer, cheer, football, okay. rugby. So all croquet, all of the croquet. Good for you, dude. Seriously, I'm going to kick my butt in croquet. And I'm not so good. Okay. The 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 mallet. All, doesn't the head always come off the hammer mallet thing? Or maybe I'm just playing with a cheap set. <laughs> All of these types of sports, when you think about it, when you first started that activity versus maybe when you were at your prime, okay, what was the difference in your ability to perform that task? Hugely different, right? And that's where training comes into play. Where what we know, if we look at EEG activity, that's electrical patterns within the brain, and we look at, say, for example, myself throwing a baseball from the mound, okay? And then we pick your favorite pitcher in the major leagues. And they're a right-hander, because I'm a right-hander, and we look at the EEG, uh, EEG activity, we're gonna see that there's much more activity going on in my brain throwing a ball, trying to make it to home plate, okay? Notice the words that I chose very carefully. And there's less EEG activity in that professional athlete because they become more efficient in using that neuronal circuitry with training, okay? Same thing with the pianist. How many of you play a musical instrument, okay? Those of you that play a musical instrument versus those that are learning the clarinet or learning the piano or learning how to play drums or guitar, the amount of brain activity necessary, electrical activity in the brain map, when you're learning those activities is much larger than when you're actually very proficient. You become much better with training of finding the most appropriate neural pathways uh, to give you that activity in an efficient manner. Okay? So we can leverage that clinically because if one pathway shuts down due to a stroke or to trauma or damage, we can actually kind of reroute, if you will. So the complexity of the nervous system is vast. This is the link to that trailer, and I'm sure you can find the whole movie online if you wanted it. Okay? So we're trailing a little bit behind where lab is. You, you were doing the dissections a couple of weeks back, but we'll make a lot of parallels to the sheep brain dissection uh, as we go through this lecture. But we've had this fascination as a species with the central nervous system, primarily the brain, for literally centuries. Okay? And we've been trying to understand what the different components or parts of the brain are responsible for. Now, let me ask you this question. As a species in modern day, what are the world events that provide us with leapfrog understanding, meaning significant gains in understanding about the brain? What do you think those events are in humanity that gives us the opportunity to learn incredible new information about the brain? Not the internet, okay? It's a good guess. Internet in history is very short, right? I mean, mid-90s, so it, it's maybe 20 years old. MRIs. MRIs, technology? War. Say that again. War. Wars and conflict have been the greatest opportunity for us as a species to study the human brain. And we've had leapfrog 
understandings after major war events. The World Wars, the Civil War, okay, where combat injuries will come in, and as a medical community, especially within the military, we have access to learn about where those traumatic injuries have taken place. And when trauma occurs to a certain lobe, we see the manifestation clinically of the patient can't walk. And so we see these maps that come out about what part of the brain leads to certain functionality. Okay? So when you're dissecting the sheep brain a couple of weeks ago, and you're looking at the different lobes, a lot of that knowledge and understanding came from studies where the brain was exposed, and then probes could be inserted into those areas where the lesions were, and we could identify what the manifestation was. Okay? So we have this fairly um, well-established map of the brain, and that's kind of where it came from. And it, it's stood the test of time, it's kind of been um, honed in a little bit, uh, and uh, in addition to war, probably the next biggest tool for us has actually been animal research. Okay? So casualties or injuries within a military give us access to uh, human subjects, and then, of course, very specific animal models studying different types of diseases or brain lesions or even, in some cases, trauma, as bad as it might sound. The whole goal there within neurophysiology research is to better understand how do we treat certain types of diseases in humans. So we can see that the, the brain is organized into two hemispheres. We have a left and a right. There's really two brains. We have um, the gyri, which are the um, ridges that come up. And then we have the sulci, which are the valleys or the invaginations or the folds that come into the brain. And what's the purpose of having uh, ridges and folds within the neural tissue? It increases the surface area. You actually have a greater capability of putting more volume or mass within that particular cranial space. And there's been lots of speculation on not only intelligence level with different species, uh, partly in fact related to the size of the brain, but a lot of it has to do with surface area of the gyri and the sulci. So if you look at lower level vertebrates, okay, animals with backbones that also have a brain, and it's organized in a similar fashion, like the sheep brain that you looked at. It's not obviously as large as our brain, especially the ratio of the brain to the organism. We are much smaller than a sheep in size. But our brain is much larger than that sheep brain. Were you amazed at how tiny that sheep brain was? They're not very bright animals, just so you know. Okay, if you've ever been referred to as a sheep, that's not a compliment, just so you know. <laughs> Um, actually, a pig would be a better compliment than a sheep because a pig is a very intelligent animal. Okay? So some people don't realize that. They're also extremely aggressive. They're smart and aggressive. <laughs> so the next one, the folds, is also the relative size of the frontal lobe. Okay? This frontal lobe is where intelligence lies. It's where intellect lies. It's where your personality sits. And that's a higher order brain function. And so in Homo sapiens, in humans, it's very, very developed, uh, the frontal cortex. Now, between the two lobes, we have the corpus callosum that actually connects them. You can't see it from this picture. Um, let's go to this picture. The corpus callosum actually connects the two cerebral hemispheres. And uh, the cerebral hemispheres are separated by this longitudinal fissure that comes down. And you can see another picture of the gyrus and the sulcus, which is actually singular. Gyri, plural, sulci, which are um, plural. And then we also have what we call gray matter and white matter within the brain. And we talked a little bit about the gray versus white matter in our last segment. What's the main difference between the two? Myelination. Now, someone, one of your colleagues asked a question after the last lecture and said, why is that, that some... Um, uh, neurons within the brain are not myelinated. Well, it, it takes a tremendous amount of biologic energy to manufacture myelin. What I mean by that, biological energy, is 
you're taking a cell, and that cell is producing extra phospholipid bilayer. And as it makes extra phospholipid bilayer, it has to manufacture the proteins that go in the transmembrane protein, and it has to manufacture more lipid bilayer. And so that, that process, that manufacturing of that myelin takes energy from the cell. And so you're not going to use myelin if it's not necessary. So some examples, and this analogy doesn't hold true on every single case. But if you have signals that are moving from one part of the central nervous system to another, and it's a very short distance, is it absolutely necessary to send it via myelinated fiber? Maybe not, okay? Because it's very in close proximity. Now, another situation is what if you're sending it down to a muscle efferent effector in the lower limb. Longer distance, you want it to travel more quickly, you may decide to actually send that information via a myelinated fiber. Now again, that rule doesn't hold true on every example, but it gives you some explanation as to why not everyone necessarily needs to be myelinated, and it is very expensive, biologically speaking, to actually create myelin. So the folding increases this surface area uh, in an extensive way and allows for um, greater intelligence in the species, especially Homo sapiens. Now the brain itself is protected. It's obviously a pretty critical structure. It's protected by um, a skull cap, a cranial cap, a hard shell. But even deep to that are three distinct meningeal layers, tissue layers, that provide not just a uh, layer of, of protection physically, but they provide um, uh, cushioning, they provide for uh, space to exist between the layers where fluid uh, can, can arise. And so we see that these meningeal layers, as they move from superficial, the outermost layer is called the dura mater, and then the middle layer is known as the arachnoid mater, and the deep layer that's really touching the brain, sitting right on the brain itself, is the pia mater. And this space between the pia and the arachnoid is called the subarachnoid space. And that subarachnoid space is full of fluid, right here. That fluid is known as cerebral spinal fluid. And the cerebral spinal fluid is blood filtrate. So it's filtered blood. It's most like plasma, minus a lot of the proteins. And it provides its own circulation for the brain. It's almost like, in a way, a radiator, okay? Where it circulates through, it keeps the temperature of the inside structure of the brain on a homeostatic balance. It provides nutrition. It allows for waste products to be removed. The brain itself, the tissue, has a vascular supply as well. You're going to learn about that more extensively in 202 when you talk about the circulatory system. But this is independent of blood vessels. This is sort of an internal, only in the brain and spinal cord, uh, network. And the way that it's organized includes that subarachnoid space, but it really begins with the ventricles. The ventricles in lab were those models that you looked at that kind of looked like the Starship Enterprise. Do you remember? And you could see the large lateral ventricles, and then you could turn it sideways, and you kind of see down the brain stem where the third and the fourth ventricle lie. So these ventricles are internal chambers. The word ventricle means chamber. You'll see that same terminology next semester when you talk about the heart, because the heart has ventricles as well, two of them, and those are chambers or rooms, okay? So there's four ventricles. There's a right and a left lateral ventricle, and there uh, is a third and a fourth ventricle. And within each of the ventricles, the lining of that chamber or that room, sort of the wallpaper around that chamber or that room, is called the choroid plexus. And the choroid plexus, the plexus means a network, an architecture, where vascular elements come in, blood vessels come in, and there is a barrier right there that exists with those ependymal cells and endothelial cells on the capillary side 
And that's what we call as the blood-brain barrier. And you've probably heard that terminology. And the, the reason it's a barrier is there's very tight connections between those cells that doesn't allow things to cross between them. Small molecules can cross, but large molecules don't. Certain large molecules that don't cross are certain types of drugs or narcotics. Other molecules that do cross can influence the brain very quickly because they cross the blood-brain barrier very readily. But they're usually more small molecules. So that choroid plexus is found in all of the ventricles, and it filters the blood to create cerebral spinal fluid. So every single ventricle is capable of making <coughs> cerebral spinal fluid. So this is a view of how these chambers look. Here's an anterior view from the front. Here's a lateral view from the side. You can see the lateral ventricles, they kind of swoop out into each of the two hemispheres. And the fluid here collects down into the third ventricle, which travels through the cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. And then ultimately it travels into the central canal that travels down the spinal cord. And then it travels back up through the subarachnoid space it ultimately is going to drain back into the venous circulation. It returns back to the bloodstream. So we'll talk about this flow here in just a second, but let's talk specifically about cerebral spinal fluid. So it's a clear, colorless fluid. It bathes and um, covers the surface of the brain. So uh, in a way, the brain itself is floating within a basin of cerebral spinal fluid. So it's a very delicate organ, and it's sitting in a fluid bath, like it's floating. So given the season, Halloween's around the corner, okay, just a little over a week away. How many of you have ever bought for apples? It's a really disgusting thing to do, <laughs> by the way. Have you ever, like, there's like this YouTube video of bottom for apples, it's like slow mode. And so you can see all like the saliva dropping into the basin after they, they come up and they're like, yeah, and they're like, right? And then it's just, it's disgusting, okay? It's really bad. But you get the idea. There's a basin full of apples. If you've never bought for apples, you can just try this at home. Go grab an apple, fill up a pitcher or a bucket and drop it in there and it's going to float. So this is kind of the analogy that the brain is, is basically floating within a bucket or a cavity that's full of fluid. So it's buoyant, it cushions it, right? It creates insulation, and that fluid actually is uh, nutrition for the, the brain. And any of the waste products get buffered by the fluid. Not only that, the fluid is recycled. It more is produced and a little bit is drained out every day, right? You have, at any given time, only about 150 milliliters a cerebral spinal fluid uh, in the central nervous system. That's it, okay? Uh, like this water bottle, this water bottle holds maybe about 400 mils, right? So you have almost a quarter, right, of that amount, maybe a little bit more than that, in, in, your, in your ventricle system circulating through. That's not a lot. Um, so the, uh, the, the function of the cerebral spinal fluid is buoyancy, protection, and chemical stability as it mitigates waste products. And now we have this kind of awkward uh, pictures here, and we're talking about hangover. Because uh, I know nobody's ever experienced it in this class, but I'm sure you've seen it on TV. Um, so what's going on with, with large amounts of alcohol being consumed... Alcohol is, uh, is a diuretic. Do you know what that word means? It gives you diarrhea. Well, you drink way too much then, dude. <laughs> a diuretic makes you pee, right? It stimulates urine production. You're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Well, caffeine also does the same thing. It's a diuretic, too. But if it increases urination, what that means is it actually pulls water out of your system, and it's, it's dehydrating you. So alcohol takes the water out of the system as a diuretic. And so what ends up happening is blood volume will start to shrink. If blood volume falls, what's going to happen to cerebral spinal fluid levels hours later? 
they're also going to be depressed, right? And if there's only, you know, 150 mils, which is maybe, maybe about that much of fluid, right, circulating that your brain is actually sitting in, it doesn't take a whole lot to decrease that 150 down to maybe 120, and there are certain spots where the brain is actually now resting on the uh, skull cap, and that produces a tremendous amount of pain, and that's where, you're hang that's where you've seen the hangover on television <laughs> manifest itself. So, <clears throat> circulatory pattern of cerebral spinal fluid it has its own circulation. It moves, if we look at this slide, it moves from the uh, choroid plexus in each of the lateral ventricles. It flows through a uh, foramina, the intraventricular foramina, interventricular between the two ventricles, foramina, hole. So it literally translates as the hole between the ventricles. The intraventricular foramina, and it moves into uh, the third ventricle. At the level of the third ventricle, the choroid plexus here adds more cerebral spinal fluid to your uh, pool, and then it moves through this cerebral aqueduct, and it moves into our fourth ventricle. As it moves into the, the, the fourth ventricle, um, the choroid plexus here adds more fluid to it, and now it moves through uh, the lateral and the median aperture, and the lateral aperture allows it to go into the subarachnoid space. The median aperture allows it to go into the, um, uh, sorry, the lateral aperture allows it to go into the central canal. The median aperture allows it to go into the subarachnoid space. And as it comes down the subarachnoid space, uh, sorry, the central canal, it'll ultimately move back into the subarachnoid space where the rest of it is. This circulates back up through into what we call the arachnoid villus and this drains it back into the venous sinus. The venous sinus is just a collection of uh, vessels that are going to dump it back into the blood circulation. So it starts at the choroid plexus from arterial blood, and it ends in the venous sinus back to the venous circulation. Make sense? Here is a shortened version of the same list. Here's a shortened version of the same list. So here's where the value is to come to class because this is the one I would study for the exam. This is the one that's obviously more complete. This is the one that I will write the question from. You can choose if you want to tell your friends who aren't here today that information. But you can see one through six. No, let me get you guys. You guys are feeling the love over there. No, no. <laughs> Core plexus produces CSF. It flows through the intraventricular foramina into the third, through the mesencephalic aqueduct, which is another name for what? Mesencephalic aqueduct is another name for cerebral aqueduct. Okay? Mesencephalic is just an older term than the cerebral aqueduct. Moves into the fourth and then into the subarachnoid space. Uh, this between the uh, arachnoid and the pia. And you've got choroid plexi in every single ventricle producing additional fluid. Okay, we're spending a lot of time on CSF, but it's actually very important. In fact, there's a disorder, and I'm sure you covered it in lab, and it's called hydrocephalus. This is a ventricular disease where it results in overproduction of CSF or a compromised ability to drain CSF back into the sinuses. And given the fontanelles, what are the fontanelles in the skull of an infant? They're those portions of cartilage that haven't fused where the sutures in the skull haven't completely hardened. And so the brain, can, the, 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 the skull cap can enlarge a little bit, right? Remember that? Well, if you have an overproduction or a lack of drainage of cerebral spinal fluid, you can build pressure into the ventricle system. And you, you have this disease known as hydrocephalus. I mean, it translates as water on the head. And now the head starts to swell. And some of you are like, that's a fake picture. Whatever, dude. Like, I've seen that on the internet. It's not real. No, this is a real disease. In fact, I'm going to show you a case study that is, is just like two years old. It's not in this country. Because we don't see this much. We mitigate it pretty quickly. But 
in other countries that don't have the health care that we have, this can be a real problem. The swelling of the head can uh, accumulate um, pressure within the brain, and that can shut down function of certain components of the brain. If it's a critical function, the individual could actually die. It could be lethal. About a third of folks uh, have normal intellectual function after it's treated. If it's left untreated, there's an extremely high mortality rate because it won't self-correct most oftentimes. Now, this is a case of hydrocephalus. I'm not sure why that got formatted weird there. But this is a uh, young girl named Runa, Runa Begum. And she's from India. And um, some of these pictures are going to be a little challenging to look at. But she, uh, she had hydrocephalus. She had an overproduction and a blockage of CSF. And um, what ended up happening was uh, these two photojournalists that were traveling, they were traveling around, um, and they were from Norway. And they went into India, and they went into this little town, and they're trying to do a documentary for some school project. And I don't remember, I, I didn't find out from this case study uh, what exactly that project was. But they ran across Runa and her parents. And dad is a bricklayer. It makes about uh, $3 a day uh, laying bricks. And so what's that, $15 a week? So it's not even probably enough for like a Starbucks every day. Um, to put it into the United States currency. That's what I was trying to do for you. Um, so, re very poor. Uh, isn't able to, to uh, provide treatment. But these two um, college students decided that they wanted to start a crowdfunding website to raise, what they needed to do was raise about uh, $1,600 U.S. Uh, to cover the shunt surgery. So what, what, what the procedure is, is to implant into the subarachnoid space uh, a tube, a shunt, and then insert it back into the venous circulation so that it allows for the cerebral spinal fluid to drain. And that sh shunt surgery costs about $1,600. Okay? It's about the price of your class fees, probably. So in two months, these two students raised more than $60,000 U.S. And one surgery wasn't enough. That's the good news. Uh, is that there was extra money to go back. She had to have five shunting procedures to correct her head size. Um, when, when they first met her, she had a circumference of a head that was about 94 centimeters. 94 centimeters around, that's about three times the size of a normal infant's head at that age. She's 18 months in this picture. And you can see the little caption down here. I don't know if you can read it, but it says... Uh, four months ago, the circumference of Ruma Begum's head was 94, almost triple the size of a normal baby. Okay? Her eyes are actually open. She's trying to open her eyes in this picture, but the problem is, is there's so much pressure, it's closing her eyelids down. Okay? So they raised this money. She had five shunting procedures. Um, this is her after her last procedure. Here's her dad. Okay? And... Um, <clears throat> Uh, this is her, most recently, her um, final um, image was taken on Christmas Day, December 25th, 2013. So it was about, uh, almost about two, slightly less than two years ago, right? Because yeah. it's going to be uh, December 15 here in a couple of months. And uh, you can see that her head size is, is uh, much more proportional. Um, and this is just an example that these types of cases exist today. They're not archaic. It's not, if you're going to practice medicine outside the U.S. borders, you're going to see a lot of things that we don't deal with anymore because of the medical care that we do have. But there's a lot of organizations, there's a lot of um, ways that you're going to be seeing patients, uh, maybe even in um, other third world countries, uh, that are going to be um, uh, manifesting themselves in, in a very similar way. Okay. Question in the back. Is there also a chance of relapse once the shunts in place? So the shunts can block up uh, and it can come back. Most oftentimes uh, they don't. They do pretty well. I think her case was actually extremely aggressive. That's why there was five procedures. 
But the other thing that, um, I don't know how to say this nicely, but, uh, you know, their, their understanding in, in this little village of how to do the shunting procedures is not what it is in the United States. So it may be that the reason there needed to be so many is they weren't as successful. They didn't get it to the right spot. You're talking about pediatric neurosurgery. So you're going to extremely small spaces with small diameter tubing. Um, and if it gets into the wrong location, or if the tube kind of presses up against uh, a meningeal layer, it'll naturally clog up on its own. So, you know, there is a lot of practice of medicine advantages that we have that a lot of other countries don't. If there's a blockage in the cerebral aqueduct, how do they, like, remove that blockage? There's a blockage in the cerebral aqueduct? Yeah. Well, so, <coughs> if it's in the cerebral aqueduct, they would actually have to... Uh, try to go in from the central canal in the spinal column and up through. Uh, that would probably be extremely challenging to do. Um, otherwise, the shunting procedures might have to actually go into each of the different ventricle spaces to try to drain the respective ventricles because that cerebral aqueduct is basically the main channel. Okay. Again, I, I mean, now I'm kind of making stuff up. I have never seen a case specifically like that, but uh, I imagine it's a lot more complex than if it just needed to shunt from the subarachnoid space, which is the most common. Yes? When someone dies from the disease, is it just the pressure that like, crushes the brain? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it shuts off certain functions. We're going to get to some of the functions of the different lobes, but um, so for example, if, if uh, the pressure inside the brain, I'll show you I should have queued it up. Um, I will post on BB Learn an image of, it's, it's a coronal picture of, um, here, I'm just going to do it right now since you asked. Hang on. This is a coronal shot of an autopsy. This is from my PATH class. Um, but I actually I just lectured on it last night. So um, you can see the size of, all right, we're going to get all atypical now. And, you're going to see all sorts of funny stuff. But um, the lateral ventricles in this, in this view are ginormous. Okay? And what it does is it starts putting pressure on uh, many different components of, of the brain, and it shuts down their function. So if it's going to shut down the function of like respirations, the patient's going to stop breathing. Um, they'll probably lose consciousness first. Uh, there's, no, there's no question about that. Um, oh, wait, I didn't want to do it that way. Close. What in the world? <coughs> huh. Now I'm all. There we go. All right, ready? Here we go. Just because you asked, you're gonna. I think you'll really find this fascinating. Okay, so don't worry about cerebral edema. This right here is a coronal section like this. That's a coronal section as well. What what is this ginormous chamber right here? Those are the two lateral ventricles from a hydrocephalus patient. This is what they're supposed to look like right here. See the relative. So yeah, I mean, do you see all this mass, this, this thickness? Look, at, it's all smashed up against the skull cap. So it's totally lethal if you don't treat. Make sense? That's what I want to, I mean, a picture says a thousand words. So it's just a whole lot easier to show you what I'm talking about versus um, trying to um, describe it. Okay. So another one, shifting gears away from um, hydrocephalus, is a disease known as meningitis. How many of you have heard of meningitis? Okay, quite a few of you. Well, you, you should because it affects college campuses on occasion. Why? It, it affects uh, military barracks and college dorm rooms, uh, dorm uh, facilities, because of the high uh, population density. And it's very often caused by bacterial infection of the meninges. 
but it also could be fungal or viral. And the symptoms are very flu-like. They could be rigidity of the neck, a sudden high fever, altered mental status, irritability. Okay? You're like, I think my roommate's got meningitis. <laughs> okay. Um, the uh, effects are swelling of the brain because there's an inflammatory event happening within the neural tissue. And that inflammatory event brings edema or fluid into the neural tissue itself. It also can be fatal because as similar to, um, well, I guess it is that picture that I showed you and I said ignore cerebral edema. Now I'm telling you to talk, uh, remember it. So the ventricle pictures where it was swelling from the inside is different than what happens with meningitis. Meningitis is an inflammation on the outside and the main part of the brain, the parenchymal or the functional tissue of the brain becomes swollen with fluid. But it all results in a basically the same thing because the skull cap confines the ability for the brain to swell. And as fluid builds up, it puts more pressure on different lobes of the brain. There are some vaccines that are available, um, but some of them um, are used uh, much too late. Again, a vaccination needs to be happening before the virus shows up, or in some cases before the fungus shows up. Uh, bacteria is, is very diff difficult to vaccinate against. Now, the Neisseria meningitis, Neisseria meningitis is the type of bacterial infection that's very common in college age populations and middle age populations. Okay, you see that? I put myself in the exact same category as you in one sentence. And then streptococcus pneumonia, this is actually the pediatric and the geriatric population is most sensitive to streptococcal pneumonia. Um, if we look at the gray matter versus the white matter, we can see how things are organized and we're starting to move into the portion of the lecture. We're going to talk about different functions of different parts of the brain. So before we get to the different functions of the different parts of the brain, let's talk about gray versus white matter. Gray matter is a major component of the brain um, and the central nervous system, which consists of the brain and the spinal cord. It consists of cell bodies, um, the dendrites themselves, uh, and the unmyelinated component of the axon. Also, the glial cells or the support cells and it is very, very different from white matter where it doesn't have myelinated axon tracts. We've talked about that. The nuclei are organized into groups. And as they're organized into groups, um, we find that they function in these clusters, in these nuclear groups. There are three regions of the um, cerebral, uh, of the brain, the cerebral cortex, the basal nuclei, and the limbic system that are primarily made up of gray matter, okay? The cerebral cortex, the basal nuclei, and the limbic system. We'll talk about all of these in the next portion of the lecture. Now, the white matter is organized very differently. The white matter is organized into myelinated axon tracts. The <clears throat> axon tracts that we see have three main types. They could be projection tracks. Projection tracks usually go between a higher portion of the brain to a lower portion of the brain. So let me explain. The brain is organized in three main axes. We've talked about one already. It's divided between the right side and the left side. Correct? And the commissure Right? The corpus callosum connects the right side to the left side. So that's this type. Commissure, an example would be the corpus callosum. That is a large white matter tract that connects the right side from the left side. Then we have <clears throat> projection tracts. Another way, another axis the brain is organized is uh, from top to bottom. From rostral to caudal. Rostral is a, a Latin term that means head, and caudal 
uh, is a, a word that means tail. Okay, so top to bottom. And what happens is the higher brain functions happen up high in the central nervous system, like in the frontal cortex. Your intellect, your personality, uh, what makes you funny, what makes you witty, okay? what allows you to problem solve, figure a way out of an issue. Okay? That's all higher level functionality. Lower down on the brain, like at the brain stem, you see things that happen subconsciously they don't even have to think about, like cardiac rhythm centers. You don't sit here and go like, beep, 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 beep. Oh crap, beep, beep, right? You don't have to think about contracting your heart. That happens at the level of the brainstem. So the higher order functions that are complex and the autorhythmic stuff that's not as complex, don't confuse not complex with not important, those happen lower down. And so projection tracks are tracks of white matter that connect higher thought processes to lower level processes. And then the last one are uh, association tracks. Association tracks typically connect, they're myelinated fibers, they connect one region of the brain to another. Oftentimes, the association tracks are on the same hemisphere. And so the third way the brain is organized, first one is right to left, second one is top to bottom, and the third way uh, is from back to front. So let me explain. <clears throat> The back or the posterior aspect, the dorsal aspect of the central nervous system, is where a lot of the sensory input comes in. And as the sensory input comes in from the posterior aspect, it moves through to the front of the brain and you make decisions about what to do with it. So your sensory portions are primarily located towards the posterior aspect and your motor output, what you're going to do with that information is towards the front. Make sense? And as it comes in and moves through, right, that's when it's like where you, you, you speak, you're like, I shouldn't have said that. It moved too quickly through, and it should have slowed down on the way through, okay? So those are three main axes. Now, let's talk briefly about cranial nerves. There's 12 of them, sensory, motor, and some are mixed. There's a picture of them. You covered them in lab. Any questions? <laughs> we are not going to spend a lot of time on the cranial nerves because I know that you cover them in extensive detail in the laboratory and they're not even part of the central nervous system. But we always put them, because they're in close proximity to the brain, we always put them in these lectures and they're in these chapters in the textbook. Okay? But we will cover them throughout the semester when we get to them in certain types of situations. Like for example, when we get to the last unit, we will cover a lot of the cranial nerves as we talk about the special senses, okay, that, that basically uh, deal with the head only. So we will cover them along the way, but we're not going to uh, have a picture like this on the exam where you have to label them. That's actually laboratory. That's your question, okay? You don't need to know the Roman numerals or the names where I'm going to quiz you about which one is this, but when we come across them physiologically, like for example, in the uh, special senses, we're going to cover cranial nerve uh, 8, which is the vestibular coccular nerve, okay? The vestibular coccular nerve, cranial nerve 8. When we come to the last unit of the semester, you will have to know that, but you'll have to know it because this cranial nerve 8 actually bifurcates, it spits. Splits, excuse me. It doesn't spit, it splits. <laughs> and as it splits, the vestibular nerve goes to the vestibular apparatus, and the cochlear nerve goes to the cochlea. And the cochlea is for hearing, and the vestibular apparatus is for balance. Okay? So we will cover many of these, not necessarily all of them, we'll cover many of these as we walk our way through the semester. But as you study for the exam, don't memorize this picture. Okay? Again, I don't know if you want to tell those that aren't here that piece of information, uh, but it's a little mean if you point them in the wrong direction deliberately, I'm just saying. All right, so let's move into some of the different regions. Some of the different regions. 
We've got some old terminology that, yes, because I'm old, I will require that you know it. And the reason that I want you to know it is because when you move on, if you go to medical school, or if you move on to PT school, or if you move on uh, into PA school, you're going to many times come across some of these terminologies in the primary literature. Old terminology that I want you to understand where it comes from. And you can pull out this slide from 2015. <clears throat> I'll sign it for you if you'd like. And you're like, oh sweet, I saved this slide. I knew that I would need it. But these terminologies like the mesencephalon is the midbrain. So remember we talked about the cerebral aqueduct? And I told you the mesencephalic aqueduct is an old term for that because it's in the middle part of the brain. That's why it's called the mesencephalic aqueduct. Okay? So the midbrain, otherwise known as the mesencephalon, the forebrain, the front, is made up of the diencephalon and the telencephalon. The metencephalon is the pons and the cere uh, cerebellum. Um, the hindbrain is made up of the metencephalon and the myencephalon. The myencephalon is only called the medulla oblongata. Okay? And it's broken up right here as well, and we're going to walk through it. Now, on the exam, how am I going to list it? I won't ask you a question only about the mesencephalon. I will put midbrain in parentheses. Okay? Or if I say the diencephalon and the telencephalon, I will put forebrain in parentheses. So I don't necessarily uh, want you to have to flashcard memorize the terminology. I want you to be familiar with these terms. So if, if you run across it in the future, you're not like, that's not a real thing. Keller did a lecture on it. It's not real. Okay? You're stupid. Right? You don't want to tell your medical professors that they're stupid because you've never been exposed to it. Okay? But for a 200 level class, I will go ahead and put in parentheses the more current, relevant terminology that you've been studying like in laboratory. Okay? I just want to make sure that you're exposed to it. So let's move on through the forebrain, which is the cerebrum and the diencephalon. Now the forebrain is organized into lobes. Right? We've got the frontal, parietal, occipital, and the temporal. And this is very much reviewed from lab. They're named after those cranial bones that they sit underneath. Uh, and they're color coordinated here for your convenience. So the frontal is in blue, and the parietal is in purple, uh, the temporal is in yellow, and the occipital is in green. Now I want you to notice. The frontal lobe and this particular segment, which is called the precentral gyrus, this precentral gyrus is located towards the front of the brain is where your motor activity is situated. On the other side of the central sulcus, which is called the postcentral gyrus, in the parietal lobe that parallels the precentral gyrus, this is towards the back, and this is where your sensory cortex sits. So that architecture that I explained to you of sensory towards the back and motor towards the front completely fits with the organization of the central sulcus, the postcentral gyrus, and the precentral gyrus. Okay? So it's a good thing to remember because if you get mixed up on the exam, you can think, you know, party in the back, business up front. Or I guess that's a mullet, right? <laughs> so the frontal lobe, the frontal lobe in blue, the functionality of the fun frontal lobe is higher thought processes. It's where your intelligence sits. It's where your personality sits. Uh, the posterior border of the frontal lobe is that central sulcus. Um, the primary motor cortex that we just talked about here, colored uh, sort of in this uh, gray uh, lined uh, region, is, sits in the frontal lobe. You also have this region right here known as Broca's area that sits in the frontal lobe. And Broca's area is uh, a region that allows for uh, word formation, actively speaking. And so, one of the ways that I like to ask test questions, 
on this stuff is what happens if you have damage to a specific part of the brain? What's going to be the result? Let's pretend the patient has a stroke, and that stroke targets Broca's area. What do you think is going to be manifested on a physical exam? What are you going to see as a symptom of a stroke in Broca's area? Lack of speech. Speech impediment. Okay? Difficulty forming speech. That, 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 that might, might st stutter, right? That cannot find the words to say. Okay, so these are very, very common results after a stroke that's affected the frontal cortex. Again, motor function, it's towards the front, it's in the frontal lobe, and a broke is aphasia. Aphasia is a language disorder. It'll, you, you can understand words just fine. The problem is you can't speak functionally with the motor like you would want, or quote unquote normally. Causes, stroke, a head injury a brain tumor, or other types of brain infection. So if meningitis was to target and actually infect that particular area, you could actually see some aphasias taking place. So what happens when um, there's like children that are growing up where they stutter? Like... Right, so those are aphasias. They may or may not be a Broca's aphasia. Um, they might be a Broca's aphasia. It may just be um, uh, association tracks, that like, like what we talked about before. So those association tracks that are taking information from Wernicke's area and connecting it. You see this area, arrow right here? So Wernicke's area is, and we're going to talk about it next, this is for um, word understanding, sensory input. And so a lot of children that have maybe a stutter or a speech impediment that need a speech pathologist, a lot of times there's underdeveloped pathways that go from Wernicke's area to Broca's. Okay, so, so they have a, 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 a stutter, right? And, 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 and it'll go away. As they grow and you work with them to get over their speech impediment, you can find other association tracks that haven't been used through training, through therapeutic methods, right? And you can get a lot of these young children to use different neuronal circuitry as an association track, white matter, myelinated, to go from Wernicke's to Broca's and the impediment goes away. Okay? Now, in a stroke patient, they're older, so a lot of those tracks are gone because they faded away, they died off over the years. And so what's happening with a young child with a speech pathologist, uh, there, there's like a 97% chance that that kid is going to speak just fine when they grow up. With a stroke patient, the numbers aren't quite as good because they may not have quite as many neuronal circuitry collaterals that haven't been used as the young patient. Okay? One more example I want to talk about. How many of you, uh, uh, have we talked about Gabby Giffords yet in this class? Did I mention her? Okay. So Gabby Giffords was a senator, a uh, congresswoman, excuse me, a congresswoman from uh, Tucson who was, uh, there was an assassination attempt made on her and a bunch of her staff in, in like a Safeway shopping center. I don't know if you knew this. Well, um, one of, one of the uh, tra uh, traumas was actually through Broca's area. And so very early in her recovery, she had a tremendous problem uh, trying to communicate. And with her husband, she would just write down and pass a note, so what she wanted to say. Would just get, she'd always carry a pad of paper. And she'd try to talk and just finally get frustrated and write it down just fine and hand it over. Because the motor cortex was fine, uh, most of it. The, the writing part. She had some damage to her lower legs, like the region is responsible for the lower legs. But um, she, through physical therapy, has actually improved significantly. And if you hear an interview with her more recently, uh, she's been able to, through physical therapy and training, come up with new pathways in order to get around that particular trauma. What about people with multiple sclerosis? That so, so multiple sclerosis, uh, the problem there is it's not necessarily reversible, uh, and neither, I mean, we're not saying this is reversible, but we're finding alternative pathways. The problem there is with MS, the myelin on the alternative pathways is being compromised just as much as the main pathways. So there may be a period of sort of clinical latency where they kind of plateau, and then it'll start coming down again, okay, with multiple sclerosis.
Okay. Um, frontal lobe. Uh, moving on. The parietal lobe. This is where we find Wernicke center. So the parietal lobe is towards the back. Is it motor or is it sensory? <laughs> sensory. Okay. So fully expect on the exam to know what the different lobes do. And my favorite way of asking is, what happens if a patient's in a car accident and there's significant trauma to the parietal lobe, right, the purple one, what's going to be the result? Well, if it targets the um, primary somatic sensory cortex, this one right here, the postcentral gyrus, there may be problems with detecting sensation in certain parts of the body, right? There may be just general numbness on the right side of the body. So you've heard uh, stroke patients talk about this. Well, you know, um, I had a stroke and, um, you know, motor problem or issue with a stroke on the right cerebral hemisphere in that motor cortex is maybe the hand kind of does this now, okay? And, and maybe the legs kind of atrophy and they're sort of a kind of a gimpy type of walk. Or the other one is nothing visibly looks different, but they tell you, I can't feel anything. I can move it just fine, but I can't feel anything. It's cold, okay? So they'll wear um, socks uh, and long pants because in the middle of the summer because it feels ice cold on the left side if there was a right cerebral hemisphere stroke and it targeted uh, the postcentral gyrus. Matthew. Uh, what about people who have a lisp? With a lisp? Yeah, how does that affect? Well, so all of the, we'll get to that, but all of the speech um, deviations, if you will, are going to be housed in various locations. If it's a motor function with a lisp, then there's an aphasia that's harnessing out of Broca's region. And if it's with understanding or, um, so you've heard of Tourette's syndrome? So in Tourette's, they can speak just fine. You can hear them loud and clear, okay? They're not stuttering. They just called you an a-hole, and you heard it, right? Um, and it was the church, and it wasn't appropriate, and it was the pastor, right? But they don't, they can't control, they don't understand what they're saying. And that's a warning problem in this center. So all of the speech, the gamut of speech abnormalities, whether it's a stutter, or it's Tourette's, or whether it's um, uh, just a general aphasia, is going to affect one of these two centers. Now, there's other centers as well that feed into these, okay? Like even the uh, visual cortex feeds into these because, you you know, someone spooks you, the auditory cortex, someone, you know, comes up behind you and goes, boo, and you go, da, right? <laughs> so, so there's obviously auditory and visual cues that go into the speech centers, and hopefully you just said something like that instead of something else, right, at church in the first row. So all of these are going to be... Um, controlling how you talk. But Wernicke's aphasia, uh, the, the word production is fine, but the comprehension is what's damaged. So they're aware that they're speaking, but they can't stop or control themselves. In some cases, they don't even understand what they're saying. It may not actually make sense to you. Same causes, stroke, head injury, brain tumor, or brain infections. So the way that you would differentiate on the exam between these two centers, uh, parietal lobe, uh, postcentral gyrus, or frontal lobe, precentral gyrus, is the output. Is the output sensory or is the output motor? Does that make sense? Okay. Next up, temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is uh, responsible for uh, controlling auditory, hearing, uh, smell, taste, interpretation. The uh, lateral sulcus is what separates the frontal from the parietal and the temporal. Now the temporal is located right here. Now some of you say, well, isn't this all sensory and it's on the side? Aha, uh -huh. gotcha, Keller. <laughs> well, it's sensory, but if you look at the mass, it's, you know, this, these are our organizational strategies. It's not the brain really cares. Oh, it's sensory in the back and motor in the front. So that's what Keller said. I'm just trying to give you architectural clues as to how to remember it. But the, the, the temporal lobe is located in the mass, more of the mass is towards the posterior aspect of the brain versus towards the front. Does that make sense? 
So that's how I would still consider it. You're going to see this motif exist when we look at the spinal cord as well. When we look at the spinal cord, there are dorsal or posterior horns that come in, and there are tracks that move up. Some of those kind of creep over to the ventral aspect of the spinal cord. But the bulk of them, 95% of them, are located towards the back aspect. Now, the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe uh, towards the very back, right? And this allows functionality-wise uh, for you to see uh, well, or what we call visual acuity. The, the visual acuity uh, can be influenced. This, the transverse sulcus is what separates the occipital from the cerebellum. Uh, and this... Uh, idea of seeing stars when you smack the back of your head is a real phenomenon. So we just left action potential, right? We talk about how we can electrically stimulate a nerve. Well, if you have a nerve and you were to mechanically flick it, it would actually fire an action potential. Because you're, you're disrupting the membrane. By disrupting the membrane, you would allow for ions to flow. So when you strike the back of your head like this, and you're seeing stars or spots, it's because you're triggering a signal of vision even though you're not looking at anything. Now, in the last moments, I want to introduce this idea of um, the pre and the post-central gyrus, which we've already talked about. Post-central gyrus for sensory, pre-central gyrus in the frontal lobe for motor, and this really strange map. And this is where we're going to end. This is our last slide for today, but I want to I explain it. So this is the post-central gyrus, which is sensory. This is the pre-central gyrus, which is motor. You can see this one's purple. Here's the purple. This one's blue. Here's the blue. Okay? What you have here is you have a map of the entire body on the sensory aspect. So nerves that come from the sensory in the periphery from the different areas of your body, innervate in these particular locations on the postcentral gyrus. So if there was a stroke to this portion of the postcentral gyrus, and it was on, say, the left side of the postcentral gyrus, well, the left side controls the right side of the body, so the numbness and, and the, the, the sensory coldness would be on the right side of the face. Likewise, if the stroke was on the less the left side, uh, pre uh, uh, frontal gyrus, which is motor, then the motor result on the right side of the face would be uh, the drooping of the face, right? Because that muscle tone is gone, and so the the, the face is going to droop. The eye will kind of always stay open. Okay, and you'll get the you know. So this is how we can identify if you see a patient or you have a patient and there is the result, even without any imaging, if you know the way it's organized, you can usually figure out where the damage is. Okay? Guys, have a nice weekend. And this is what we'll pick up on Tuesday.